so it looks like we've kind of slowed to a trickle of people coming in. So I'll continue letting people in as uh, they join. Uh, but we're here today to hear from Jeff uh, about the DNA of hope, the science of the positive framework here at the 2021 Hope Summit. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Jeff to kick us off for today. Thanks, Shannon. Th thank you, everybody, for the honor of, of being here. I've met several of you, and for those that I, I haven't, it, it's good to at least meet you virtually, and I, I look forward to someday maybe being able to connect in, in person. And um, here's some of what's um, about me in the bio. I think you've, you've read that, so I'm not going to um, read through these things. I, I just want to say that I just have such a passion for learning about this work. And I learned from uh, teaching it, right? We, we learned so much by teaching and I learned from engaging with communities. So th thank you for the honor of, um, of being able to, to connect. Um, so I, I wanna start off with, with, with a quick story and, and a question too for you all. And, and I'm just gonna say, no joking, there we were on a dark night in, in 1974. And, and yes, I'm, I'm that old. Um, and there was about five of us, young male adolescents, and we, we had a spray can. We had, a, we had spray paint and it was about midnight in our neighborhood. And we started doing bad things with that, right? And we did that to a neighbor's driveway. And then the lights came on, the, the lights came on, um, in the house, so we dropped the can and we ran. We all just ran and you know, ultimately ended up at our respective houses. And the next morning I had a knock on the door. I had a knock on the door and I, I heard a man's voice and sure enough, it was the neighbor and uh, we were kind of pulled out and there was a the group of us was, were all pulled over to, to his house. And we were thinking that this is not gonna be good. And some of us had, you know, some very um, authoritative and even abusive parents. And this would not be received well if, if, if they had been pulled into the loop. So he brings us all to the driveway and we're all standing there. And then he pulls out the spray can. He says, boys, I think this is yours. And we're all kind of shaken at it about this point, right? I think we're about 13. And he says, you know what I'm gonna do? And we're like, no, sir. And he goes, I'm going to ask you to spell my name correctly. <laughs> we had misspelled his name in the driveway with the spray paint. And so he had us, um, we, we missed a, an R. There was two R's in his name. He had us spell his name correctly and then um, said, okay, see you guys. And there was, there was something about that experience that was so positive for us when we were expecting and, and well-deserved some, some sort of really, you know, natural consequence, harsh consequence. And instead we were met with some sort of a, a sense of kindness from this person. Of course, as we were going, he, he and his family had immunity from anything else, you know, toilet papering or anything else throughout our, our adolescence from that. But the, the, the bottom line is, is this, we experienced what I call the hidden untold goodness. There's often these webs of support. I call them hugs, right? Hidden untold goodness. And, and, and we experienced this positive experience with, with this person um, who I later um, throughout my, my childhood then came to realize what an amazing man he was and an amazing father. But to have that positive way of dealing with us was pretty amazing. I wanna ask you in chat box, where have you experienced something where there's a positive experience or what I call a hidden untold goodness that, that may have shown up for you in, in your life, at, in, in, in your childhood. Did you have anything? It doesn't need to be a story like, like mine, but I'm, just, but I'm just curious. Have you had something um, where you've experienced this hidden untold goodness? Baking with your aunt and, and walking your dog, painting your grandma's house, being on sports teams and continuing to enjoy the, the sports um, as an adult. What's amazing about these, if we start to unpack these as well, is it's about relationships. There's something that's 
of all the literally thousands of things we experience, somehow these are sticking out for us, aren't they? And um, perhaps we can unpack some of those. Thank you, folks. Um, I appreciate it. What we're going to get into here is um, really unpacking some of what I call the, the, the DNA of hope. And, and the, DNA, the DNA of hope is, is the science of the positive framework. What I want to do is, is pull out some of the strands of, of, of um, what goes into this and what in, went into the development of, of the, the hope strategy over, over the years with the purpose of you being able to understand some of these and then maybe start to think about how you can apply these in your work, in your hope work or in, in whatever professional work you have. Here are the four objectives that we want to work with. In terms of the spirit, we want to have experience some of the energy of what this science of the positive or a positive framework can give us. It, it gives us back a sense of energy. I'm hoping we have some of that. We want to explore how hope emerged, especially from a positive community norms um, project that, that we were engaged in. Um, I'm going to talk about that in general, but in particular, that was in Wisconsin. Um, we're going to brainstorm some ways we can integrate these ideas in our work and, and then just have some time to reflect on things we've learned. I'm gonna, I've set this up to where we're going to have some chats and maybe even come off chat and have some conversation throughout. Um, that, that's pretty much the, the structure. And I just wanted to start too with, with this. And this is strategic and intentional, starting with something positive. What's a joy you've had in the past 48 hours? This is a really important opening whenever we have a meeting, whenever we have are bringing people together. What's a joy you have experienced in the past 48 hours? Interesting how much we see too as, as we do this um, in terms of the amount of connection with nature, with pets, and with, um, with people. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of themes there. It's beautiful. So as you all know that hope is um, is also an acronym, which is um, which is you know healthy outcomes from positive experiences, and we're going to unpack some of that. Um, initially, when we did this, we we formed a partnership with Tufts University and, and Montana Institute. Montana Institute, we we really and still function this way as, as like a, a resource and and training arm for for hope. And there's many materials that I I loaded different materials for you, and I loaded. Um, almost the majority of all these PowerPoint slides that you have, um, that's in your, your packet, your PDF, but there's other materials on our website that you could access as well um, that I just didn't wanna um, load up in one mega PDF. Um, I also wanna put a shout out to, this is where we've been doing the majority of our HOPE training for the past five years, basically, is at our annual Montana Summer Institute. And um, would love to see some of you join us. We are virtual again this year because of COVID, um, that is um, Lone Mountain, Lone Peak, Big Sky, Montana. Um, 2022, we're hoping to be live again, but we'd love to have you join us. We're looking at transforming norms and narratives with, with the science of the positive. And uh, Shannon, if you don't mind dropping this in the chat box, this is um, gives us, here's a link to, um, if, if you wanna just receive some information we'll, from us, if we have trainings coming up, we will not spam you. It's, it's just for the purpose of identifying when we have enough people for a training and then we can launch something. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. I'd, I'd like to start with this, this idea of a core assumption. I'm gonna go slow and unpack some of the strands of, this, of the DNA, the science of the positive, that is essentially this framework underneath the hope framework. And just, um, I'm intentionally going slow with some of these things so that we, could, we can pull them out and, and explore those. So what I wanna do, um, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna bring up another word, okay? And I want you all to, to look at the screen right now if, if some of you aren't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna bring up a next word right now. And as soon as you see it, stay on mute if you would, but I want you to shout out the next word that you see, okay? All right, so I want you to do that. So as soon as you see it, I want you to shout out the first word that you see. So ready? Here it comes. Sorry. 
So I was I was watching people's lips a little bit. Which was it that you you which was it that you saw? Go ahead and just throw that in the chat box too, if you would. What what word first came up for you? When what was the first thing you saw? We said spirit is nowhere. Is is what I'm mostly seeing. Spirit is nowhere. Some are saying spirit is now here, but most are saying spirit is nowhere. Interesting. So essentially part of why we're doing this is, um, you know, when we talk about the importance of hope, it, it's about grounding our efforts in a positive spirit. We're gonna spend some time here spirit first and I'm gonna tell you why, and, and it's by design. Um, in terms of breathing life into our, our work. And, and it's, it brings a, an important energy and a critical perspective to our work. And I'm gonna show you how we utilize this um, strategically in, in different ways. But the, um, the positive childhood experiences that, that supported us that we talk about, um, it, you know, one way we can look at that is in terms of, the, of the, how it's impacted us in terms of our own spirit and the spirit of this work. And we talk about adults who care about us or the family traditions, cultural events or celebrations. I think we could add outdoor activities that we just experienced too. Um, here's something that, that comes up as we're exploring this core assumption. Albert Einstein was once interviewed um, by a journalist. Um, and, and, and the journalist, it, it was well into uh, Dr. Einstein's career. And the journalist was asking, so what's the next frontier? What's, what's the next big thing we need to look at? What's the, what's the next most important question that, that we need to ask? And, and Dr. Einstein answered saying, the question we need to ask is, is the universe a friendly place? Is the universe a friendly place? Because the way that we answer this question for ourselves really starts to determine where we put our energies and, and where we start to amass resources. If we are seeing the universe as being a dangerous place, um, Dr. Einstein in that particular interview went on to say, you know, we're gonna then stockpile munitions. We're gonna, we're gonna build up defense systems. But if we see it as a, um, a friendly place, um, then, then maybe we're gonna be looking for ways to invest in, in benevolence, right? So I wanna ask you just in, again, in terms of chat box real quick, is your community a friendly place? I think this is an important question for us to ask when we're st first starting to enter and do, do some community work. Do you see that your community is a friendly place? So I think this is an important question that, that we ask. So it starts us to move towards what I call a core assumption. Um, I believe we can take time. I did this actually after, you know, as part of my doctoral work and then beyond and just started peeling through layers thinking, you know, what if there is this, this, this core, at, like a taproot idea from which all the others come from? What, what if we just continued to peel back assumptions through a, through a process of, of questioning and what, what might that, that look like? And we could get to this deep central core of all beliefs, this, this root from where our assumptions and opinions all, all stem from. And so I've intentionally spent a lot of time exploring that, but I wanna know, do you have a core assumption? And you may or may not, but do you have a core assumption? I believe there's a value in engaging in a process to, to do this type of reflection because it, I think it really impacts what we do in terms of our theories and our approaches and how we frame research questions. So I'm curious right off, do, do you have a, a core assumption? What, what I have found and, and what I've focused on in terms of the, the, the science of the positive work is the core assumption with the science of the positive is that the positive exists, that it's real, it's worth growing. It's something that we can actually experience, we can measure, we can share, we can expand, okay? So this became one of the core tenets that, that started to, to help us develop then what um, became um, uh, some of the work in, in the, the HOPE uh, frame as well. 
An another element that, that resides is that the solutions are when we gather in community. Our solutions are in our relationships. Solutions to whatever problem we may be thinking about that exist in, in coming together. So we talk about the spirit of the work. Um, I want you to um, tell me, I'm going to say that um, I bet every one of you have seen this image. I bet most of you, all of you have, have, have seen the actual footage of, of the, the great Reverend Dr. King and probably could cite exactly what he says here. Again, don't come off mute, but he, I will give you the, the first three words, which are, I have a, and what is the next word? Right, seven step strategic framework. It's comprehensive and evidence-based. It's multifaceted. It works across the social ecological continuum, right? Well, not exactly and, and no. And actually that wasn't even what he was planning on saying was I have a dream, as you know, if you know some of the backstory, but what did he do? What's the purpose of what I'm saying here? The great leaders, the great orators, they don't start with science first. As much as we love this, people, we're scientists. I'm a scientist. But the great ones, are they, they start with a sense of spirit first, and, and they go to that, that core assumption. And for us, this core assumption is whether or not the positive exists, right? And so transformational leaders are, are going to challenge core assumptions, not just with science. But they're going to do it at that other level. They're going to speak from the heart first. And then they're going to come up and, and talk to the head. And so one of the things I would like you to get out of this is that I think we need to dare to bring hope by creating conditions for the positive to exist, for creating conditions for the positive exist. That this is one of the challenges for us as transformational leaders. How do we do that? This is going to be one of the main teachings of, of what I'm hoping you get out of our, our, our time here um, today. And that is, it, it goes into what we call the cycle of, of transformation. The backdrop or the backstory on this is, um, if we look to nature, we can see this happening all the time. First of all, um, okay, quiz time, people. I am looking where I took this picture I'm standing and looking south. I'm, I'm just going to, spoiler alert, I don't need you to go Google it. I, I'm just, um, it's about 20 miles west of Bozeman, Montana, where our, our home is. And I'm looking south towards, that. those are the Spanish peaks, the Gallatin Range. And these are three rivers coming together to form a fourth river. What, what river is this? Do you know? It's a major river in, in the United States, just kind of. I guess y'all didn't see a geography. Yes, Margaret, it is the Missouri. So the Missouri River. So why am I showing this? I'm, I'm showing this because we look at water cycles. We look at nature. Nature occurs in cycles. Transformation happens in cycles and in, in flows. And so when we look at that, there's an exchange of energy that, that happens in, in the cycle and in the flow. And a lot of the incredible wisdom of indigenous communities um, are, are, are coming from recognizing that, you know, the four directions or the four elements of, of these. So um, the work that we do works in a cycle as well in terms of looking at spirit, science, action, and return. There's a sense of spirit, science, action, return. This is part of one of the strands of the DNA of hope that if, if you can hang on to, you'll be able to apply and, and I believe see some, some really powerful things happen in your work. We're going to unpack this a little bit. So we all have this vision of the, of the world being a, you know, wanting to make the world a, a powerful place. And we start to put this together in terms of creating frameworks and, and developing a framework. And I, I need to say this about any framework, including this one I'm talking about, that all frameworks are wrong, but some can be helpful or useful, right? I mean, I think that's how we need to look at them. Um, they're all wrong because they're not um, the, 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 the thing that they are pointing to, right? We look at this cycle of transformation that sets up the frameworks that we work with. And we're always moving through this cycle in this specific way. 
spirit first, then science, moving into action, and then into a, a, a return. So it'll be spirit, science, action, return. And you can see some different words here. Each of these is a different domain. Each has a different energy, a, a, a different function. And I want to take a little time to unpack these. And then, I can, then we can start to see how they start to show up and how they have shown up to be the framework. This has really helped form the framework for, for, the, for, for hope. So we start to ask different questions. These are some of the kinds of questions that, that we would ask at, at the beginning of a, a project, for example. We do a lot of um, different statewide projects with uh, um, different prevention issues, child maltreatment prevention, uh, child development being one, but we do a lot with substance abuse, traffic safety, and um, uh, other issues, worksite health and safety. We want to understand that we have different relationships to these, and it would matter in different contexts, right? If we were sitting outside doing this, you might have different words. Or if we were sitting in, in a corporate structure or in church or synagogue or whatever it may be, we have different relationships to these. But we talk about the spirit of the work, and we always start there by design. Um, much of our work has been about trying to reverse some of the traditional ways that we've approached health and health promotion. And instead of focusing on a sense of the hurt, the harm, the shame, um, instead we're gonna shift and look at the, the connection, the love, the protection. So it would be by design that we're gonna essentially claim what type of spirit or tone that we wanna, we wanna create the context for. Um, and, and welcome, right? So th this is by design and it, it's intentional. And we want to be doing things that are going to focus on the positive. And, that, and that's where we're going to move into more. But before I, I do, I want to say, you know, the thing about a pattern is once you start to see it, you start to see it everywhere, right? Isn't, isn't that amazing? And so this has been showing up for us in all sorts of ways um, for, for quite some time. Um, one of my close colleagues um, who has recently passed, Dr. Uh, Cecil Whitehat uh, Jr., uh, um, a, a Lakota wisdom man and uh, a PhD that um, we did research and work together. He would laugh and say, Jeff, you know, the science of the positive stuff, it's, it's so old, people think it's brand new again, right? <laughs> it's so old, but this flow, this, this flow is, is, is quite old. We get very strategic and intentional with what we do. So like substance abuse prevention in communities, here's an example of how we would start to unpack this and apply it. We'd look at the spirit science action return, for example, of us doing normative message work is something that we do. Um, we are doing some work um, in Australia and the, the South Pacific and, and looking at some in, in climate change issues and. I, I know you can't read it, but you can see here were the here were the four domains that helped frame that initiative. We teach coalitions how to how to set up their agendas with this. We develop media campaigns based on this. So it it starts to to, to show up in a lot of ways. How might you use it in in some of your work? Just this is a I know this is very toe in the water, but what are some ways that you could think of that there might be an application that you could use this? Um, in, in 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 some of your work. Yeah, thanks folks. There's there's so much more we could explore there, but this is going to show up as, as one of the major themes um, throughout the rest of what, what we're talking about here. So um, moving more into the science and the science of hope. Um, Green Bay Packers coach in the 1960s Vince Lombardi, I, it, at least that's how, what I found in my research, is often cited with saying that this quote, which has been recycled by many others over the years, but he used to say, <clears throat> hope is not a strategy. And I want to say, yes, it is, right? Hope is a strategy. In fact, it's a strategy that as we developed this, it was based on the science of the positive and that we seek to grow the positive in terms of experience and norms in individuals and children, adults, systems, and cultures. 
So here's where we start to move from the spirit of this work into the science. And this is based on that core assumption again, isn't it? That core assumption that um, the positive is real. And it, it, it really started, um, there was about an eight year period of my being involved with CDC work with, in different roles. And there was one where I remember Dr. Segi and I were in the back of the bus going through some of the levels of the security. And, and, and we started to ask the question, well, what if, what if the positive has, has these lasting impacts that, that are similar to what we see with, with ACEs and trauma? What would that look like if we, if we really started? And so that's where we started to develop um, health outcomes from positive experiences came out of this, the, the, the science of the positive framework um, and, and the work that we were doing there. And I, I wanna give out a huge shout out that this article that Bob mentioned in, in his keynote, um, that hope exists because of the, the work that the CDC did in what's known as Essentials for Childhood Framework. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I, I, I put some of that together for you to, to see because we look at the DNA of hope. What are the strands of, of what hope is, is made out of? This is a big one. This is a big one. So I'm shifting a little bit to say, here's another basic concept that will continue to show up. I call it red arrow, green arrow. I mean, if you really want to break things down as simple as you can, public health is red arrow, green arrow, right? We're going to grow the protections and we're going to reduce the risks, okay? Uh, talk about essentialism, um, maybe run amok, but, th but that's what we're talking about. And so we've been focusing on ACEs for the past couple decades, right, as a, a scientific community and for all the right reasons. And at the same time, it made sense that the the positive childhood experiences also exist, right? The green arrow is always there. That's what's beautiful about this work. It's not one or the other. It's a both and. So that's what we started looking at. However, there was a need to really enhance the green arrow because much of what we see and what much of Western medicine is um, even still deficit-based, right? Or it's, it's problem-oriented. Um, and so there's a whole nother way we can look at things to complement. So hope is centered on the positive and we, we grow hope by practicing this, the science of the positive framework. And science of the positive is, is the study of how the positive factors impact us in terms of individual experience and, and culture. And then we can focus on what we wanna measure and grow. And again, it's all based on this core assumption. The positive is there, it's real and it's worth growing in ourselves. And I'm gonna really stress this for a moment. Here is the hidden untold goodness, the hug that I'm talking about. The positive is there. It may be buried. It may be hidden under layers of hurt or shame or oppression or social inequities, um, lots of other things, but it's there. And if we can create, as transformational leaders, we can create the conditions to, to allow that to emerge. Here's a snapshot of the framework. We're not gonna unpack all these elements, but what I wanted to draw your attention to are there, there are these different steps and, and pieces, and this is some of what we teach at Montana Institute, but I wanted you to see here again, the spirit science action return is gonna be the flow that's gonna really kind of create this and get this going as like a flywheel. And, and that becomes like that operational momentum for, for so much of what we do. I do want to hit pause because I know a lot of times when we've been focused on the rigor of science and the rigor of um, adverse childhood experiences and trauma and recovery, this positive stuff can sound really fluffy, right? Like we're, this is what we're working towards. Wouldn't be bad actually. Um, but I know a lot of people sit here as, as being fluff, right? And, and with all the nutritional value of fluff, wow. So we're not talking about just a positive mental attitude and everything we can do is just do a reframe uh, kind of from a Pollyannish perspective. We're, we're not talking about that here. We're actually talking about, again, touching this core assumption that the positive is real and that we can grow it through community and that we can do it through this cycle of transformation. But we are making a point that if we want health, we're going to need to focus on and promote health. We're going to need to actually put health in the center. Health is not merely a byproduct of reducing unhealth. 
it needs to be a strategic focus. And so we have to have that ability to focus our energies then on, on the health. How do we do that? One of the ways we do that is through our work with positive community norms framework. We're gonna unpack a little bit of this. You know, so we start to say, are we getting the results or the returns we want? Are, are we able to grow these, these positive norms? The positive community norms framework then operates off the same science of the positive framework. I'm gonna unpack a couple elements of this. But once again, I just wanted to point out on the outside to you, the spirit science action return. That, that's, that's what I want us to take away from, from this brief introduction of the work. But let me ask you, so what is a norm? Um, and in fact, you could, you could just put it in your, your tech chat box if, if you don't mind. What's a norm? The, these are great, love all of these, yeah. When I think of a norm, I also think of this, right? What's in, sorry, that, that's old school. That really dates me, right? Or we could talk about what, um, in, in, this, in this day and age, we could talk about the new norms, right? Like they're doing at Pace's connection. Sorry, okay, that, that's a little humor. Okay, what is a norm? Yeah, it's what, it's what perceived standards of what's acceptable or unacceptable, you know, acceptable attitudes or behaviors that are prevalent among a, a, a particular community. So you all, you nailed it with your definition. We can operationalize that in different ways, really making it simple. It's above 50%. The norm is above 50%. It's a majority of, well, when we talk about most, most people or almost all, we're, we're communicating a norm. So um, in Minnesota, for example, where we, we've been doing work for the past 15 years, we work with 10 communities at a time in five-year cohort. Um, these are examples of norms with substance abuse prevention. And if you look from the top down, the norms get stronger. They grow closer to that 100%, right? This does not mean there's not a problem with those outside the norm engaging in a risk behavior. That's a whole other important conversation, but these are all norms because they're above 50%. We can unpack it further and understand there's really, the research shows and operationally, we look at two types of norms. We talk about the oughts and the is's. The injunctive norms are, are more like the attitudinal norms, what's acceptable or unacceptable when you all type that in. What's okay or not okay. The is's and the isn'ts. Um, here's an example of an injunctive norm. They're saying they disapprove. It's unacceptable, right? This would be how we could operationalize this in one of our projects, right? Here's an example of a descriptive norm, what, what is or isn't going on um, on the Navajo Nation in terms of meth use. That, that's an example um, there. Here's where it gets powerful as we start to look at gaps between actual and perceived norms. And why that's important is um, we, we think about the actual norm. It's what's really happening either through observed or self-report behavior, but then we have this, this perception of the norm, what we think most people feel or do, right? And there's often a gap. Look at this gap. This is actually a, a sign in, in central Montana, right? And so I, I have to ask you, so what's the norm here, right? In, you can tell me in the chat box if you want. So what is the norm that, that you're seeing? Um, in Rudyard, Montana, Right, it's it's pretty obvious, right? That the norm is nice people, but if if we go if we go to pick your favorite news outlet and you have breaking news, what do you think they're focusing on? Right? No, they're not talking about the nice people. They're talking about the sorehead crisis and sorehead crisis in central Montana. Details at ten, right? Right. So news, by definition, is often fun focused on that outside the norm, right? This is a whole conversation too. So much of our work in terms of hope is about transforming what we look at and transforming the narrative to, to work back towards that hidden protection, that hidden goodness, those powerful hidden norms that are operating. Um, and we have to know how to do that by learning how to mind the gap because what we focus on becomes our reality. 
And then perception becomes everything for us in, in this work. We, we talk about this because a lot of times we have these skewed views of how we're looking at young people or families. And we start beating this, this, this drum of, of, of negativity. And everything we're seeing is through what I call cultural cataracts. This, it's, a, it's a dark lens on folks. And it starts to show up in the data as well. Um, here's an example, um, a typical example of what we see when we start measuring different layers or levels of the social ecology. You can see the actual norm um, up, up top in terms of the majority not ever trying. This is lifetime use for, for high school students. Um, however, look at the perceptions. Most misperceive, most think that most have, or most think that others in there have as well. So I just have to put, say this, that one of the problems that we run into with misperceptions like this is that we have riskier environments that people are having to navigate. When we have false narratives, we have riskier environments. And we see that this pattern consistently shows up. We overestimate the amount of risk in the environment and we underestimate the amount of the hidden protections, the goodness, the hopes, right? Um, we saw this with, with one of the first, you call it one of the first hope studies um, we did back in early 2000s. Look on the far right, 75% of Montana parents, this is a statewide study, said, yeah, I've talked to my kid, have had the talk, you know, about not using alcohol drugs, you know, if, if you go out at night. Um, but only 15% of these same parents thought most parents around the state were having that same kind of conversation. Yeah, I'm doing it, but I don't think they are. So I named this not my little angel because we started to show it up, see this show up again and again and again. Yeah, I have a curfew, but I don't think they do, right? Yeah, I monitor and engage with my kids with homework, but I don't think the most other parents do, right? Here's that cultural cataract showing up. These dim skewed views that are, that are not based on, on reality and it becomes a risk factor the misperceptions of norms become a hidden risk factor because what we perceive to be real starts to show up for us as being real and its consequences. But it also becomes a protective factor too. This, this is um, a risk showing the risk that the majority of, of students, the, the, those that misperceive are, and think most other students drink, are much more likely to engage in that risk behavior themselves. We can see the inverse as well with, with things. So our big aha with the norms research and the implications for hope is that the, the perceptions and misperceptions of norms operate as hidden risk or protective factors. Accurate perception of protection is, is, um, is really important. So we can start to ask, you know, where are your gaps? What, what is it that, that you wanna look at? And this takes us to how some the HOPE um, framework evolved was through a, 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 um, a project that I was involved in with um, Jennifer Jones, um, who's now at Prevent Child Abuse America, but was at the Wisconsin Children's Trust Fund. We started looking norms across the state of Wisconsin. On the left, you can see that most Wisconsin adults agree that improving the well-being of children and families is important, right, for strong communities. So most, 70%. However, 72% didn't think most other Wisconsin adults felt that same way. So it's, it's almost an exact opposite. Yeah, I do, but I don't think they do. And think of what happens in a vitrolic environment when it's like, yeah, us and them, and, and what we've got in our, in our political discourse now with, with some of that. But we can start to create messages that start to set the record straight. So this, this is why so much of this work, how do we transform a narrative? This is how we do it. We get real strategic and we use the science of norms to come in and, and start to restructure that, that narrative. We see it with child maltreatment issues. In West Virginia, for example, the norm majority of parents um, um, most strongly agree that babies you know, should, should sleep in, with with the safe sleep practices. However, 83% misperceived the norm. 83% of parents misperceived it. 
and 97% of the home visitation providers misperceived it. So what I need to say is we too are part of the carriers of the misperception people. We as professionals are also carrying these misperceptions and we need to do our own work. We need to shift some of our own narratives. There's so much beauty and so much strength that's out there. And if we can gather the data to show it, we can then reflect this back in, in so many important, powerful ways. So we need to question some of our own perceptions and, and misperceptions and see if the positive exists. We do it with a four-step process. Spirit, science, action, return, people. Spoiler alert, right? The spirit of the positive, how do we uncover that? And, and the science of measuring these gaps that we've been talking about and actions for challenging misperceptions by having a portfolio of strategies to get this kind of a re return or result. And so I'd, I'd like to ask you, and you could jump into your chat box again, you know, what is it you'd wanna grow in your community? What kind of returns or norms would you like to see? We start with a green arrow. I'm not asking you, what do you want to see less of? I'm asking, what do you want to grow, right? So what would be some of the positive norms that you might want to grow in, in your, um, your community? This is a really important conversation that we would typically, if we were together on site, we'd spend a lot of time generating some of this and then look at operationally, how, how do we measure some of these things? Um, so thank you, folks. Um, so I'm gonna, um, in terms of some of the actions, I, I just wanna point out a few things. Again, it's from the CDC's work at Essentials for Childhood that the HOPE framework came into being. We we're integrating that with the, the science of the positive. And I wanna point this out. Look up top here. Here's a red arrow. There's your concern. Here's your green arrow. There's your protection. This is very important and very strategic. All of your successful health communications go red arrow, green arrow, or they go green arrow, red arrow. And we teach that. And we, we, I think we need to be very intentional about that. The hope and concern live side by side. And there's some really important ways that, that we can use that. So why do the, what do we know from the, the hope science that, you know, in terms of what we've learned from Essentials for Childhood is that both positive and negative experiences shape, um, shape the developing brain and, and who we are. And yet it's the positives that improve health and help us heal. And by golly, they're a lot more fun, aren't they people? Right, I mean, isn't that? Um, and so here's what we know, again, is, is that the experience is what shapes the development. And it's a positive experience that promotes healthy development. The adverse experience can derail this healthy brain development, right? That toxic stress, right? Especially during some of those rapid periods of growth and childhood, early adolescence. But um, this is what we know. And this is what, this is what I think was one of the huge contributions that, that the CDC has, has had over the past couple decades is that ACEs are disrupting healthy brain development. Well, now we're looking at the fact that positive childhood experiences are promoting. It's red arrow, green arrow. It's, it's both of these together. And that's why I think we can discover it's never too late for us to, to have a, a, a happy childhood, right? Um, and the, the way that's done through the, the work with the CDC is, is through safe, stable, nurturing and equitable uh, relationships and environments. These are, the, these are the key factors that keep showing up. And then this Essentials for Childhood document unpacks what these mean. I'm not gonna go into this. this. You can download this at the CDC. But what I did wanna say is look at this. Here it is again, people. You will see it again and again, the spirit, science, action, return. And it's my involvement um, with the CDC, with the Knowledge to Action Think Tank and all, came because of the norms change focus this piece of really looking at how can we create this context for, for norms and norms change and programs. And so the CDC um, commissioned me and I wrote this piece. I actually loaded this in your materials 
but you could go to the CDC and get this. It's basically, so how do we do that? And it will unpack seven steps for doing that. So you have this material in, in your, um, your packet, in your, your HOPE materials packet. I, I just wanted to, to let you know that. And um, here's the seven steps for, for how we start to apply that. But this is what laid the groundwork for us to come up with as, as, a, as a team, a whole, a whole team of us to develop balancing ACEs with hope. And if you go into the abstract, look what you see. Once again, we look at what is the DNA of hope? It's this spirit science action return that starts to show how, how this shows up. So. Um, again, you can download this off of my site. You can look, um, you could go to the HOPE site. Um, but basically, I wanted you to be able to start to see the DNA of the science of the positive and how it shows up. Um, and, and then it gets into some of the norm science in the work too. One of the things you'll see, for example, it's interesting. Here's a gap that... Um, only 27% of the, the people, this was a study we were commissioned by um, Prevent Child Abuse America, and it, this is in the Balancing ACEs um, with Hope. Only 27% identified themselves as engaging in prevention activities, yet the majority were engaging in these positive things, which we would define as prevention activities. So there's gaps between what we think prevention is too, right? So. Um, here are the, the, um, the measures that were included in the Wisconsin Burfus. I won't say more here because Bob mentioned this in his keynote. This is also in the Balancing Aces with Help, Hope, as is the, the, the flow of, of how these different domains can, can result in healthy adult development, right? In terms of the, these, these different elements. So the bottom line is we are the medicine. We are the medicine. Our connections with each other in relationships and in communities and cultures and organizations, families, environments, that's where the healing is. That's where the strength is. And so with that, I, I'm bringing this to a close to say, how can you see integrating this into, into your work? What are some of the things that you could see in terms of inter, integrating science of the positive and some of the things you've heard into your work. What, um, yeah, th th these are phenomenal. Um, I do wanna ask um, in terms of the return, again, this is what we hit today. We just, the, the energy of the, and the spirit of this work, how hope emerged in, you know, the DNA of hope emerging from the, the norms and the science of the positive, we're, we're brainstorming ways to use it. And here's something I wanna, I, you know, kind of as we're bringing to a close, what are some of the big things you heard that that um, that you would want to hang on to here as, as we're coming to a close? What are some of the big things? So yeah, this this is fantastic. So again, love to um, see if we're um, we do um, hope based training, science of the positive based at, at at Montana Summer Institute. Would love to have you join us this year. We're going to do it. June through September, we're just gonna scatter um, the keynotes and presentations throughout the, the summer, um, rather than trying to jam them into a three-day period. Here's that link once again, um, that sh and we can um, get back to you with, with information. Other materials are, are on our website as well at Montana Institute. But I've loaded everything related to this for you all um, as, as part of this, this, this HOPE event. So I, I want to thank you all for the honor of being able to, to share this with you. And again, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, all. It was great hearing your responses today. And thank you so much, Jeff. This was a wonderful presentation.